А наш следующий спикер Адам Фурманек. Адам, привет, расскажи пару слов о себе. Uh, I presume you wanted me to introduce myself. So my name is Adam Furmanek and I work at Amazon and let's begin talking about a bit about async internals in in C sharp and why it's broken or why it could be implemented a little better. Adam, you said you work at Amazon, so um, uh, do they use .NET a lot? Actually, it depends on the team you're working on. My organization does not use .NET a lot, but I know there are different places where they use it much more. Sweet. So how do you present about .NET then if you don't work with it much? I was a .NET developer for many years before joining Amazon and I'm still blogging about it, still working with .NET in my free time. So I'm just interested in the platform and all the talks I'm giving, they are mostly based on my like private projects or side projects, which I'm still developing and working with other third parties uh, in .NET stack mostly. Good. Adam, thank you. Now let us proceed with your presentation. The word goes to you. Okay, fantastic. I presume you can see my screen. So let's begin. Uh, once again, my name is Adam Fermanek and welcome to the talk Async, the biggest C-sharp mistake. Uh, so a disclaimer before we begin. Um, I'm going to tell you why Async and Await mechanisms are broken in, in C-sharp or in .NET platform in general. However, please understand that uh, even though this may sound like a rant or a, a bit hateful presentation about the, the mechanism, I'm not trying to discourage you at all uh, for, to, to, from using the, the async or await mechanisms. They are great, they influence plenty other platforms. However, the thing is um, they could be implemented a little differently to get advantages of uh, the things which are provided by the operating system or by the things which are there uh, already implemented in the platform. Uh, and because uh, the async and await is implemented the way it is, there are a couple of disadvantages and drawbacks which typically programmers are not aware of and which in fact influence the, the solution significantly. So We'll get through that and we'll see why async is broken, why async, the, the implementation of async is a mistake, uh, and under some time we'll understand a little more details of the, of the mechanism. Uh, so let's begin. A couple words about me before we move on. As I mentioned, I work at Amazon currently. I'm a machine learning guy working in Prime Video. Uh, I'm also a blogger, public speaker. Feel free to take a look at blog.adamfurmanek.pl. Uh, feel free to drop me a line or email, Twitter, whatever uh, you find useful for you or whatever suits, for you, suits you. And I'm also an author of .NET Internals Cookbook. So this is the book about the, the internals of .NET. Uh, if you're interested in the low level details of the platform, how these things work, Work, feel free to take a look at this. Um, okay, let's go. So the agenda for this talk, we'll understand, we'll try to see why the mechanism is broken or what the disadvantages or async and await are. So we'll go through a couple big topics, like we'll understand why it's expensive, why it uses hidden state, why it uses global variables under the hood, and why it, because of that, does not integrate well with the platform, with the .NET runtime, which is already there, or with other C-sharp uh, C -sharp features, uh, which we can use, uh, or which we were using before async and await uh, came to the language. Then we'll understand why it breaks programming principles, why all the things we learn about solid and all these things, they are basically broken in async and await, and ultimately, at the very end, we'll just take a look how we can improve this. So we'll see how this could be implemented a little differently to, to aid a couple of these events advantages. Let's go. So first thing is async and await. Well, the mechanism is expensive. Uh, I won't be going much into details around that because I do have another talk, which is called internals of async, which you can find on YouTube or something. However, every single method you implement, which has the, this async modifier, it's translated by the, the compiler uh, to the machine state, um, which is actually pretty big. You can see that we have, uh, in this method, we have like four logical parts with three 
await keywords. And initially, this method is compiled to something like this. So there is no async modifier in this. There is builder and uh, and some type which has a very fancy name like the underscore underscore one doing the job under the hood. However, if we take the full code of the compilation, you can see that the initial method compiles to something like this, which is basically almost 130, 140 lines of code just to support this one simple piece of uh, this one simple method, which we have a couple of await uh, keywords. So this is why it is something which is introduced by the compiler every single time for every asynchronous method we use. And even though we typically don't think about the cost of this, well, the cost is there, it's hidden, and because more and more methods are asynchronous, more of them, they have async modifier, the cost will just increase over time. And if you actually uh, go into the details of this, you also learn that the task class is a class. It's not a structure, it's a reference type. And because of that, it's allocated on the heap and needs to be ultimately collected by the garbage collector. So because it is allocated on the heap, it's something which then needs to be taken care of. GC need to try these objects, references need to be uh, processed, they need to be tracked, etc. So this is a cost which we are effectively paying. Microsoft realized at some point that the task is expensive. So it introduced yet another type called value task, which is basically a structure supposed to be used in this uh, synchronous scenarios in which we just return the value. Uh, there is also a couple more things like value value task source, which is a, a type yet another type yet another mechanism for us to pull the value tasks to avoid even allocations of these types or these instances where we actually need to go asynchronously. I highly recommend taking a look at uh, Joe Duffy blog where he blogs about the Midori. Midori was an operating system in Microsoft Research Group, which was uh, the whole Win API was based on the asynchronous code. So everything was running with async and await. However, the difference over there was that the task tasks were uh, allocated on the stack, there were structures and value types. So the cost of allocation was lower. This is something C Sharp decided to implement differently. The task initially was just uh, was a class and still is a class. And because of that is expensive. And how expensive? Well, these things, they are officially provided by some like Microsoft blocks. So generally each await operation consumes like a couple hundred bytes of memory for each the method you execute, not to mention the time like measured in microseconds. So generally, if you do finish the operation synchronously, the memory overhead may be like lower for if the task is non-generic type, or it may be like something 80, 80 couple bytes for the generic task type. However, once you go asynchronously, when you physically need to block the operating system thread, the cost increases significantly and it's a couple hundred bytes for each single invocation. Now you just can go and take your uh, sealer stacks or your call stacks to see how many methods you do have on the stack to understand how expensive it may be. And the thing is, it won't get any better because, well, the async will be only more and more prevalent. So this is the cost of the async, uh, async mechanism. Let's now move on to understand why it uses hidden state. So uh, the thing which we typically learn about async and await is you just put async here, you put await there, your method just works, and that's it. The thing which is typically skipped or omitted in tutorials is that async and await, they use a thing called synchronization context to actually dispatch the tasks between threads properly. The thing about synchronization context is it's just an abstraction which is supposed to give you an ability to get some piece of code, like a job, a thing to be executed, and just run it. You don't care when, how, uh, on which thread, whether it's serial, linear, whether it's synchronous, asynchronous, you just don't care. The thing is the synchronization context takes care of that and makes it working. The issue with the synchronization context though is depending on the type of application you run, you get a different behavior. 
And depending on what you run, it may be that the code you have written, which is working correctly in one type of application, breaks when you move to something else. And we'll see examples of that in a sec. Uh, just to give you a more understanding what synchronization context we have. Whenever you run a console application, this type of application does not use any synchronization context. So all the tasks which you effectively run using async and await, if they need to continue somewhere asynchronously, they run on the thread pool. So they are run using the default task scheduler, default built-in task thread pool, uh, and this is how they are uh, executed. And you can imagine, because we have multiple threads in the thread pool, it's much harder to to get the deadlock scenario because well we just have threads to run things on however once we move on for instance to the desktop applications like winforms um, and the wpf or winrt applications well the principle behind all the desktop frameworks is there is only one thread which is allowed to modify the ui controls so modify buttons lists text boxes etc so whenever you run a continuation await something and then continue needs to be scheduled it will effectively need to go to that one single thread and because there is only one thread you may easily get a deadlock similar situation is actually in old asp.net applications uh, because there what we are interested in is not the thread which is capable of modifying the ui elements but we are interested in the particular network call we are currently handling so while asp.net was synchronizing your continuations to potentially multiple threads it was actually always making sure they run in the context on only one and the same network call which means all the continuations were run effectively serially one after another only one continuation could run at the same time it was changed microsoft realized that this synchronization content Context actually introduces more and more complexity. So now they are, they are getting rid of it. They are they remove the synchronization context from ASP.NET Core, but still there is plenty of code which relies on synchronization context, not to mention there are still desktop frameworks, which do need to obey the principle that only one thread is allowed to modify the, the, the controls. And now the thing is the synchronization context is global. So because of that, we never we are never allowed or we should never wait synchronously on the task we should never call task dot wait because of that comes probably the most important slide of this talk which is use async all the way up and use configure await false all the way down to never capture the synchronization context if we don't do this we get into deadlock scenarios so let's see how easy it is to to generate a deadlock before we see actual examples, let's make sure that we understand how synchronization context is propagated. So we start with this method, which is async void. And this is probably some method in like desktop application, WinForms or whatever else. And this method just triggers some data processing and calls a wait on this thing. If you understand how these things are implemented under the hood, whenever you actually start calling process data async, what happens is you start executing this piece of code immediately. So at this point here, we are at the UI thread, and then we move on continuing on the UI thread. So this thing also executes on the UI thread. Now comes the thing because here at this point, we call configure await false. We indicate that we do not want to capture the synchronization uh, context. However, the thing is we never know whether this download async is actually blocking or non-blocking, whether it finishes synchronously or not. If it does finish synchronously, the thing is we do not switch any thread because what happens is the continuation is executed immediately. So this continuation may still carry on on the UI thread. But typically, we just would assume that it will continue somewhere else. And because we specify the configure await false here, then synchronization context is not captured. So this continuation will be executed somewhere else, namely on the thread pool. So we carry on on the thread pool, and this line would be again executed on the thread pool thread. We again specify configure await false, so the continuation from this thing would come to the thread pool as well. And this is how method finishes. So this part would finish on the on the thread pool. 
Uh, but notice here that at this point, we did not specify that configure await false. We did not specify that we don't want to capture the synchronization context. So what effectively happens is we do capture the context which we have here. So this continuation will post the continuation, sorry, this continuation will be posted on the UI thread. So we are back at this line, we are back at the UI thread, meaning that we are allowed, we can modify the controls. So this is how synchronization context is propagated here and there. And let's now see how it can break our applications super easily. So first thing we would like to do is let's take this code in which we do have some asynchronous operation, which is trying to await for, for like one second. And we call this operation and we do call synchronous.wait, something we should absolutely never do. We should always have async and await all, all the way up in our, uh, in our stack. So notice what happens here. We run this operation and this continuation is executed on the synchronization context, which was captured here at this point. Because we are running in the console application, there is effectively no synchronization context here, meaning that this continuation will be posted to the thread pool. Because it's posted to the thread pool, it can execute correctly. So at some point, this dot wait operation will finish because the continuation will be executed correctly and properly. But notice what happens if we take exactly the same code and we switch the application type and we move to on to the UI framework. So we again have this asynchronous operation, which waits for one second and tries to post the continuation on the synchronization context because we do not have configure await false at this point. And at the same time, we just call dot wait in this line. So what is happening now is the continuation from here would like to go through the synchronization context, which would like to execute it on the UI thread. However, the UI thread is effectively blocked here because it's waiting on the continuation to be executed. So even though we have exactly one thread, it still managed to cause the deadlock and this application will just freeze indefinitely because the continuation will never uh, ever execute properly. How can we fix that? Well, in theory, it's simple because we can always add the configure await false after adding this thing, the continuation, this part, would be dispatched using the capture synchronization context because we specified we do not want to capture the synchronization context. We'll go through the thread pool and the operation will be executed on the, on the, using the default task scheduler on the thread pool. So effectively, it will finish at some point and then the wait operation will finish as well. We'll probably freeze the UI for like second or a little longer, but at least the application will continue working after some time. So it's Seems like it's super easy to solve it. Unfortunately, it's not the case because we may also explicitly ask that hey, given operation should be executed on the UI thread. So if we do this, if we do something like invoke, which under the hood goes to the UI thread and asks, hey, please execute this lambda on the UI thread, what is happening next? is the UI thread is again blocked in this dot wait operation and effectively we we get a deadlock again. So configure await false does solve the issue sometimes, but it's not necessarily a silver bullet which we can apply every single time. So we should have async all the way up and never synchronously wait for the tasks. Uh, this can be actually the opposite. So we said that we should have async all the way up, but we also need to have configure await false all the way down through our whole code base. Why? Because let's take this code. So we do start in this button one click, which calls some operation wait one, and then synchronously wait on it to, to finish. In wait one, we await wait two, and we specify that we don't want to capture synchronization context. Then we do similar thing in wait three, and ultimately in wait three, we just wait for one second, and we say that hey, configure await false. Uh, we do specify that we do not want to capture the synchronization context. So this continuation should be executed on the thread pool. And if it is executed on a thread pool, well, the UI may be still blocked, may be still frozen, but it's okay. The continuation will finish. But notice what happens here. Because we do not have the configure await false at this point, this continuation will be executed on the UI thread. And the UI thread is again blocked on this get await result. So even though we did specify 
configure our falls here on the higher level, on the upper level on the call stack, because we did not specify um, configure our falls here, the continue, continuation will still try to come to the UI thread and effectively our application will die. So this is something we need to always keep in mind, async all the way up, configure our falls all the way down. And it's actually even harder because the synchronization context is a global variable. So if you try running this unit test with any unit in which you just create and for, uh, the new form from, from mean forms, and then you just await the operation and you do not specify the configure await false, what happens in this seemingly simple test is it deadlocks. Why is it so? That is because whenever you create a new WinForms instance, this thing will just under the hood go and replace the synchronization context for you because it requires the synchronization context for the WinForms framework. Because your end unit uh, awaits the operation on different synchronization context, it doesn't know that the continuation from here ever executes. So because it doesn't know that, it waits indefinitely and we have deadlock. How can we fix that? Well, and let's see how the synchronization context can be modified. Basically, it's a global variable. So we can get the original synchronization context, create the new form, and then replace the synchronization context with the value which we captured previously. And because this is a static, globally available method, which is publicly available for anyone, effectively anyone can step in and modify the synchronization context for you. So this is what is happening. This is what happens under the hood. And that's why async and await is really broken because it relies on this global state, which can be modified by anyone, anytime. Moving on, uh, so the async and await, this mechanism does not integrate well with the platform. So with the things we had in the language before. Um, the first thing which we would like to cover is how it handles exceptions. So before async and await, we were using tasks from the TPL library to do the magic, to do the, uh, the, the tasks, to schedule them uh, together, like with continue with, etc. And the thing with tasks is they all could throw the exception. So we could have multiple exceptions at the same time, which were later aggregated using the type aggregate exception. And because of that, because there is this aggregate exception and await does not use aggregate exception, it wants to unwrap the exception, we may actually miss some of the exceptions, even though they were from properly. So let's see this code. So what we are doing here is we do create two tasks which are attached to parents. So we effectively, because we still use the task type, we don't create like a linear series of, of tasks to be executed, but we effectively create a tree of these tasks. And you can see that we do throw two exceptions here, one from first task uh, and the other one is called second task exception. And then what we do is we just await this task. However, what you see in the output is we get only one of these two exceptions. The other exception is effectively lost and we cannot get it. We cannot get the, the access to that exception. From our point of view, it just disappeared. How do we, how do we fix that? How can we extract this exception to report all of them properly? Well, we effectively need to use the TPL code. So return to the previous solutions before the await, await world. So we need to create a continuation which will be executed like on the faulted task here. So we use this continue with, with additional flags and then we effectively see that yes, we do get second task exception and there should be also first task exception as well in the output. So we can see async and await, they do work great. However, they do not integrate with the platform properly in terms of handling the, the exceptions. Okay, what can we do next? Um, when it comes to the exceptions in async, we probably know that uh, async void methods should be avoided and we should use async task as much as possible. Why is that? It's because async void methods, they do operate in the so-called out of band mode when it comes to throwing the exceptions. So let's actually see a piece of code which we'll execute here. So what we are doing in this code is we do have a method which is async void, which waits for 300 milliseconds and then throws the exception. And what we do is in try catch block, we call this method twice. We want to handle all the exceptions and then we print something, we sleep for 900 milliseconds and we print again. Notice what happened. 
So we did throw this exception and we did print out these, uh, these, sorry, these two lines of code here after sleep and the dawn, indicating like this part of code was executed. So it seems like even though this exception was thrown, even though this exception was unhandled, well, the application continued to work properly. However, notice what see if we just introduce a seemingly random delay somewhere in the middle. Now one could think that, hey, because I do have sleep for like second and half here, it means that this throw method finishes before my thread sleep does. So I could capture this exception and handle it here with the catch block. Unfortunately, it's not the case. And what is worse, we only get after try line here, these two lines were effectively not executed. So you can see that seemingly random sleep somewhere on the way changes the behavior of our application significantly because the exception is thrown in the out of band way, so it queues the application. What we can do also is we can change the async void to async task, but notice what happens now. Well, if we do not await these methods, and even Visual Studio tells us, hey, these methods should be awaited, you can see that, okay, the code executed properly, but there are completely no exceptions at all. So we lost them. They disappeared. They were suppressed. We can get uh, access to them by, by asking GC garbage collector to, to clean up the tasks and then registering for some event handler to, to handle these exceptions. However, the thing is, uh, well, it's easy to forget about these things. And we can already see that the platform changes behavior, like exceptions disappear just because we forgot the await keyword and like nothing stops us from making this mistake. So this is actually what, uh, what happens with exceptions. But there are a couple more issues, how the async and await, how they do not integrate with the platform properly. Uh, so, uh, when it comes to awaiting async void, well, the thing is, we cannot await async void, but we still need to use async void in multiple places. One of the examples, the pretty popular one, is we need to use it in like event handlers in desktop applications, right? So how do we await async void methods? We cannot do it directly. We can do some hacks by re-implementing a piece of the platform. So what we are going to do now is we are going to await async void methods uh, by re-implementing the synchronization context and the uh, and, uh, uh, task scheduler. So what we are doing is we do have this method, async void throw, which waits for a sec and then throws the, the exception. What we want to do is we would like to wrap execution of this method into our custom task scheduler, custom synchronization context, so it works properly and propagates the exception. So we start with implementing custom task scheduler, which is basically a collection of tasks here, and we do have a couple methods like to, for executing the task and for queuing the task. And then we can implement the, the synchronization context, which what it does is when we want to run something, it replaces the original uh, synchronization context with our custom one. And then what it does, it uses the task factory. The task factory we create up here, the task factory, which, uh, which first hides the, the default scheduler and uses our custom one. So we want to get rid of the mechanisms built into the .NET platform. We want to get rid of the default uh, thread pool, the default task scheduler. We want to use custom things. And when we do so, we can effectively go through our custom synchronization context, go through our custom scheduler, get all the tasks, and basically execute them one by one. And if they throw some exception, that is perfectly fine. The exception will be propagated. And because we executed in this task.run method, we effectively have some task which we can just return. So what we do next is we use our synchronization context helper method to run this pro, the, pro method and then we can sleep, we can do whatever, whatever we like because we already have this task which we can later dot wait or dot get await or get result or just await whatever we would like to do. And you can see there is the catch handler which effectively 
handle the exception properly. So you can see this exception was, was swallowed at this point and it was printed out and this done line was printed out at the very end. So we can await async void methods. It is physically doable. However, you can see how much magic we need to do uh, just to, to, to catch all these exceptions. Okay, but this is for async void methods and well, one can easily tell, hey, we should not be using async void methods. But it's not the end of the world and the story doesn't, fin doesn't end here because, hey, there is one more thing in C-sharp language which is effectively void from our point of view and this thing is called constructor. Like, the whole point of constructor is to return the instance of the type we are creating, but we cannot return task of something from constructor, unless obviously this is the constructor of the task type, which is not the case in our code. So what you see is we cannot use asynchronous constructors because we cannot put async on the constructor because then it would return the task, which is not allowed. What we need to do is instead we need to use the so-called async constructor pattern, uh, which basically works on this principle that we have a private constructor, so the constructor which is never exposed, and we have the factory method, which is a static method, which creates the instance, which calls some initialize async method, which finally can do all the magic to initialize the, the object. The problem or the issue uh, of this approach is that, hey, there is plenty of code which relies on the constructors, not to mention that, hey, constructor is a super important primitive of object-oriented programming. So creating objects using this factory method, it's against the OOP idea how we should implement applications. Not to mention that there are classes which rely on the constructors, for instance, activator for creating instances or some JSON libraries which do parse objects and create them via reflection. So if we provide custom method, all these mechanisms, they have no idea that they could use it or they should use it to initialize our instances. So this is yet another place where async and await, they do not integrate with the platform properly. But it's not the end. Moving on. Uh, like, you, we cannot use you lock with the await keyword together. Why is that? Well, if we do understand how the synchronization context is propagated, this should be pretty simple, right? Because this continuation, because we do not specify configure await false, the continuation can execute basically on any thread. It's not guaranteed to execute on this one thread where we did take the lock, where we did acquire the, the monitor. So what happens effectively after, uh, after finishing the, the um, waiting for the continuation would effectively change the thread. We would be on some other thread, so we would not have the lock. Not to mention that because if we waited for this uh, for this operation here, we would effectively exit this method so the lock would be released. So this is definitely against the against the operation which we would like to do. However, we know that the lock keyword under the hood is compiled to monitor, enter, monitor, exit. So nothing stops us from re-implementing the code this way. So instead of using lock, we do monitor, enter. We print out the thread we are on. We await the, the, the thingy. And then we pr print where we end up on which thread. And you can see that initially we started on thread one. And after awaiting, we are on thread four. And what's more, we get the exception. Why? Because we try to release the monitor which was taken by some other thread, which is obviously incorrect. Not to mention that this monitor is released way back, even before the operation, the asynchronous operation finished. And okay, it's easy to say, hey, we know that log is protected. Compiler will tell us, hey, you are making a mistake. But what about the native code? What about the interop with other uh, technologies? And what about like system-wide mutexes we would like to be using? Because for them, we'll effectively use the code which we have here, meaning we take the log, we do something, then we manually explicitly release the log, we cannot use them with asynchronous programming at all because they break. We need to rely on some other libraries like AsyncX providing synchronization primitives which we can use between asynchronous contexts, but again, all the things which we were given before, like operating system primitives, they are unusable for now. Um, 
And moving on to the last big part, uh, it breaks the decent programming principles, like the principles we learn at the university, we learn at school, we learn at work, that, hey, the code which we write should obey some general good principles, good rules to, to implement the code which works better, is easier to maintain, and basically it's nicer according to the rules by the book. And unfortunately, async and await, they do break these principles. The first principle they break is never wait without a timeout. This is the first principle of multi-threading or whatever parallel or concurrent programming. Whenever you wait for something, always specify a timeout because if you do not, you'll hit a dead deadlock sooner or later. This timeout may be some like ridiculously high value, for instance, a day or whatever works in your application, but sooner or later, you will just see that this timeout actually was hit because some Thing broke under the hood. So how do we await with a timeout in, uh, in the async and await scenario? So the thing is, if we start with code like this, we cannot, we cannot just do it easily to await with a timeout because await doesn't give us this, this ability. How we can implement that? Well, there are a couple of solutions and let's see a couple of them. So let's move on to the demo awaiting with timeout. What we are doing here is, uh, let's just run this application to see it. Uh, it's in some way works and throws timeouts as expected. What we are doing is we start with the code, which basically schedules two tasks at the same time. Uh, so we await on task when any. The program hang is operation, which basically waits indefinitely. In our demo, it would be like one minute. In your application, it could be something which actually deadlocks like forever, right? And what we schedule at the same time is throw timeout exception. So we basically wait for like one second and then throw the, throw the exception. So the first solution for waiting with a timeout is we replace every await yada yada with await task when any yada yada and this helper method for, uh, for uh, throwing the exception, not to mention with configure await false at the very end. And we just await the, the task which was returned. Okay. Can we simplify this? Can we make it better so we do not need to repeat this code every single time? Well, we can. We can await with extension method. So what we can do is we can provide these two extension methods, which basically wrap the logic which we have to await the task when any, configure await false, yada, yada. And now every single line of code, wherever you, the tutorial told you, hey, you just put await there, and it works, you actually now realize you should be putting await operation dot timeout dot configure await false. And this is throughout your whole code base. Not to mention that if you wanted to like handle exceptions uniformly across all the tasks, you probably could add yet another extension which, be, which would be await operation dot timeout dot handle exceptions dot configure await false. And now it was just one keyword and we have this very big long uh, line doing the, the waiting for the operation. Um, okay. Can we do it a little better? Well, there are a couple more tricks we can do. We can re-implement the synchronization context. So what we would be doing is we would run our operations using the synchronization context helper, similarly to what we did before with awaiting async void method. And uh, what we do is, again, we just replace the synchronization context, do the magic, yada, yada. And at some point, we basically uh, trigger the, another operation, which would throw the exception, and the exception would be uh, would be captured on this task we use here. Obviously, the line which we are getting here, uh, so await custom context run with Lambda, is also not what we would like to do. So let's look for yet another solution, which would be awaiting with custom some task type. Um, and starting .NET uh, or starting C sharp, I believe seven something, we can implement custom task types and specify how they need to be constructed. So notice that this method now, it returns the time my table task. It's a custom type which we provide and for which we need to provide a builder which says that, hey, time out table task should be constructed using this builder. And this timeout table task, it needs to provide a method basically move next. And also, uh, sorry, it needs to use the operation move next. And we can see that we do 
uh, trigger the throw timeout exception, which runs under the hood, throws the exception, and we set it on the original tasks if, if needed. And then we just run the regular move next of the state machine uh, code. So now our operation is finally a little cleaner. We just specified that the return type is table task instead of task, and it seems to be working. The issue is if someone, if anyone at some point casts this timeout table task or changes it to the regular task, we lose the whole, uh, the whole feature of this awaiting with timeout. So unfortunately, there is not a good solution which would work out of the box. And probably the, the most solid one is the solution with the extension method. So you specify await, operation, timeout, handle exceptions, configure await false. And this is what we should be doing across all our code base. Yet another place where we shouldn't be, uh, which we could be a little disappointed with the, with the solution we have. Let's move on. Uh, async and await, they do break yet another principle, which is do not repeat yourself. Uh, you probably noticed that during the transition period from the synchronous code to asynchronous code, plenty of operations throughout the .NET framework or throughout the libraries, they started providing two methods effectively doing the same. One of these methods is the operation, the other is operation async so returning task and doing things asynchronously and unfortunately these operations they typically cannot be implemented using one another why we'll get to that in a second and if we try the compiling for instance the console or sorry at the, the operation for writing to file like file write all text or file read all text in this example and we decompile or take the sources of .NET Platform, we can see that the synchronous operation looks like this. So we do have some assertions initially, and then we just use stream reader, read file to end. That's all. But what happens for asynchronous operation? Well, it is a little more complex, and you can see that it's actually much longer, and it effectively does the same. It reads the file in the asynchronous uh, way, and it cannot use the synchronous operation, nor the synchronous operation can use the asynchronous one. So we effectively need to reimplement the same piece of logic twice, once for synchronous, once for asynchronous operation, not to mention that this method returns a task. And if we wanted to return a value task method, once again, we cannot use this code. We would need to implement yet another method doing the magic. So we need to repeat ourselves a lot, pacing and await. And unfortunately, it looks like we'll need to be doing this for a couple more probably years until finally everyone and whole code base migrates to descend.net core some version and uses asynchronous code everywhere. Obviously, there will always be some legacy application which still needs to run on the synchronous path and needs to use the synchronous operation. So we may end with this uh, situation forever. Um, but the biggest uh, issue it has is breaks the dependency inversion principle. Before understanding why it's bad, let's understand what dependency inversion is. Dependency inversion principle tells us that we should be always implementing things which talk based on the abstractions, not the actual implementations. So in C Sharp, we can think of that more or less as talking or writing the code using interfaces, not relying on the actual class classes. Um, and now, because we should be using interfaces, we could ask a question, uh, which is, how do we replace a string? Um, like, we do have the system string type in C-sharp, right? What if we wanted to use system custom string instead of system string? And probably you may ask a question, counter question, hey, why would you ever replace a string, right? What is wrong with the string we have in C-sharp? And to answer that question indirectly, let's see some history of a couple other platforms. For instance, in Java, what they did around Java 9, they implemented or changed the internals of the Java lang string class significantly to reduce the memory usage and to speed up things. So originally, string in Java was basically an array of characters under the hood, the same way it is in C Sharp. However, most of the strings we do have, because character is 16 bytes long, not 8 bytes long, and most of the strings we have, they are pure ASCII strings. We waste plenty of space just to support this, uh, this uh, strings. 
What uh, we should be doing then uh, is we could be storing these strings in the byte arrays, right? Uh, so this is what Java did. JVM hotspot changed the implementation. So if the string is an ASCII string, it is stored using the byte array, not the character array under the hood. So we effectively get back like the 50% of the space consumed by the string. When it comes to concatenation, Previously, before Java 9, all the concatenations like string plus string were compiled by the compiler to string builder dot append operations. However, string builder may not be efficient or there may be more efficient solutions available to us. So what they decided to do in Java 9, they changed this code, which is emitted by the compiler. So it's not string builder dot append, but it's using the so-called invoke dynamic instruction, which basically generates you a piece of code in runtime once, and then this piece of code can be generated so it uses all the features of the platform you have. So now you have backwards compatibility with strings because the code is compiled once, and if you change the hotspot version, it may use different way of concatenating strings to improve the, the, the performance here. This is what happened in Java. What happened at Facebook, there is a fantastic talk by Nicholas Omrod, which is called The Strange Details of STD String at Facebook. So Facebook re-implemented their C++ string implementation and they gained 1% one perfor one performance win just by doing so, by replacing string globally across the whole, uh, the whole, co uh, the whole uh, company. Uh, you may say, okay, it's just 1%, but if you are talking Facebook scale, or if you're talking bigger scale here, they probably have hundreds of thousands of machines running the code. So 1% of that is still like a couple thousands of machines, which they now can, in theory, get rid of just by improving the performance of the string. So you replace system the string with something else, magically works faster. And now moving on to V8 in JavaScript, like the V8 engine, which is uh, used by the, the Chrome browser or by the node, uh, platform, uh, they do support plenty of different implementations of the object, depending on what the object is, what properties it has. Because obviously, an object in JavaScript is basically a dictionary, right? So just use a hash map. But most of the objects, they typically are like DTOs, just carrying a couple properties. They do not change the shape. Properties are not added and removed from these objects. So, well, they could be optimized. And depending on actual shape of the object, on the use case of the characteristic of the code, the, the V8 engine can actually store the objects in different ways to support different scenarios and improve the performance. So you can see that all these things which are taken uh, or given to us uh, and which we take for granted, uh, well, these internals can be changed and these internals can improve the overall performance. So now comes the question, how do we replace a string in C Sharp or in .NET? And the answer is we cannot. Why? Because string is a class. Not to mention it's also a sealed class, so we cannot inherit. Not to mention that it's exposed on the intermediate language level, because all the strings literals, they are currently implemented as or compiled to creation of a system.string class, not something like a character array. So because we do not have an interface here, we cannot replace the string easily, which breaks the dependency inversion principle, which you can see that it probably blocks us from getting a little more performance if we know what our use case is. Coming back to async and await, what do we have in async and await is so-called colorful functions. Imagine language in which uh, your method must be in one of two colors. It's either green or red. And when it comes to calling functions, uh, you can see that green function is allowed to call another green function easily. Is allowed, is capable of, technically can do it with no potential issues. But the green function cannot call the red function at all. And the red function, while it can call the red function, it probably should not be calling the green function here. What would you think about language like this? Well, you may question why would we ever have something like this? And this is actually what we have in C Sharp currently. Because our green methods are methods which do not return, which are not async. So you can see that void foo 
is allowed to call another void foo, but should never call async task foo because it cannot await it. Like I shown previously, we should always have async all the way up. So asynchronous method should never be called from the synchronous one. The other way, it's a little better. You can call obviously async method from another async, but you should not be calling synchronous method from asynchronous one. Why? Because then you just block the operating system level thread, so you lose all the advantages of async and await, because the whole point of async and await is to never block the operating system level thread. But it's not the end of the story here, because there is yet another type in C sharp, which is called value task. So now we have effectively three colors of our functions. There are synchronous functions, there are asynchronous functions, which should always finish synchronously or as often as possible, so they can return value task, which does not need to be awaited by aligning to the heap memory. And there are full blown asynchronous operations with async task. And you can see that while you can call a value task operation from another value type task operation, calling task from value task is now kind of a tricky because then we get the memory usage and we lose a couple of the advantages. So this is the state of the C-sharp language currently. We do have these colorful functions. We have a big issue and that's all because we do not have the interface for the task. We cannot control how the task is implemented because all these methods, they do have uh, like explicitly specified type which they return, which is either value task or task. And now, just to uh, finish this talk with some like more positive and uh, on a more uh, happy note, let's see if we can do it better or let's see if we can fix a couple of these things. And when it comes to the asynchronous code, the whole point of async code is do not block the operating system level thread. If you do block the operating system level thread, you are doing it wrong. You make things which you completely miss the point of the async code. But it doesn't mean do not block. It means do not block the operating system level thread, but we can block something else. And if we take a look at the C sharp, how it's implemented, and once again, I refer to my talk in terms of async, which covers all these things in detail. Async is C sharp is implemented as coroutine compiler level transformation. This is because we do have this state machine generated by the compiler, which transforms the method to coroutines. With service locator for promise orchestration, that's because we have globally accessible synchronization context, which is basically a service locator, which does all the orchestration, dispatches, the continuations, etc. With statically bound promise factories, that's because we do specify the, the type, return type of the method, explicitly in the code. We do not use the dependency inversion, we specify the type directly, so we statically bound the builder during the compilation time. But we can do it a little better, and because we do have only a couple more minutes, I will again refer to yet another talk, which is called Project Luminous C Sharp, in which I explain how these things work under the hood. But the general idea is that we do re-implement a couple of these things by ourselves to implement the coroutine. We use fibers like the operating system green level threads which run in user mode, and we use monads to avoid the statically bound promise factories. So let's see this in action. And because we do not have that much time, I will just go to the final part of this demo. Uh, so let me just adjust the code so we know what we are uh, we, what we are running here, and uh, recompile these things and set up startup project. And we should be we should be good. Where is the set up startup project? Async loom set up startup project run and let's see what we have here. Okay, so what we are doing now is we would like to have two operations which would we would like them to be executed together like asynchronously. So initially we would start by running two jobs which is run internal job and side job and run internal job is basically calling another asynchronous operation but not awaiting it directly just printing where we are. This another internal job just waiting waits for two seconds, awaits, prints things, returns some data, and then we ultimately awaited this job, okay? And because we awaited here, and because we do have delay here, this thing will effectively wait for two seconds. So
so we can wait and execute on the same thread we can execute this other job which is called side job we just print uh, print thing okay so we would like to get exactly the same behavior in our better solution which would not use the coroutine compiler transformation which would not use the the colorful functions but which would still uh, support the the, the um, asynchronous invocation and not blocking the thread okay so let's run these things again and what we are doing now is we are using fibers so we need to have a piece of bookkeeping which supports the coroutines and which schedules threads on different fibers and then we just add two jobs first of them the run internal job will be running on fiber number one and the other job will be running on fiber number two and the default fiber fiber number zero would be the the executing this whole bookkeeping which effectively is basically a code which your thread pool does which observes the message queue dispatches tasks calls other threads yada yada and what we can do next is we can wrap the the operation in the kind of monad-like operation so we do have some abstraction which tells us what we can do and this monad is basically an interface with one method map this is not a true map uh, sorry this is not a true monad instance as in functional programming this is just named monad here so it's easier to google this um, but skipping all the details, if we wire all these things together and we have, the, have this method, what we have then is we do have run internal method, which runs internal nested and specify how to construct the type or how to synchronize these things using the generic parameter. And then the only thing we need to do is we need to propagate this generic parameter here. And you can see in our output, we do have some job which starts execution and then we have side job so the other asynchronous task and then we do have uh, the continuation after two seconds the biggest advantage of doing things like this is we do not have colorful functions all these functions they're basically void or they just return the data but there is one more big win we can replace the generic parameter here at the top with different one and instead of using a synchronous boot builder we now use the synchronous one and you can see that previously this side job was executed somewhere here before the continuation was scheduled but now just by changing the builder we have we change the behavior of our code just by replacing it here at the top. We do not need to step in, modify the code under the hood, change the return types, implement custom tasks. We just use the generic parameter. We just use the different builder implementations. And this is how it works. So uh, uh, taking all that into account, can we do a little better with, with async and await? Well, we in theory can it's hard to actually judge now because there is plenty of asynchronous code out there in the world so it's hard to say that this solution on fibers would be strictly better or strictly worse because well it's hard to it's easy to theorize about that but hard to see this in action but the outcomes of this talk are uh, always know your synchronization context and do not abuse it do not wait synchronously on async and await tasks because it will break your application. Have async all the way up, have configure await falls all the way down, always await tasks to avoid uh, issues with exceptions, always handle the, the, all the edge cases where the exception may be thrown, and that is how you should work with async and await, keeping in mind that it's terribly broken and it could be the biggest mistake of c -sharp language. Now is the time for questions and answers. This QR code points to the slide deck if you would like to download it, it's there. And okay, are there any questions? Adam, thank you. Most exciting. And while we're waiting for the questions from our audience on chat and on the phone, etc., 
I have a question of my own. Adam, tell me, async in C-sharp is not a perfect construct. Are there languages where this sort of thing was implemented good, actually? That is a very good question. That is because uh, async and away they did implement other platforms as well. For instance, the same mechanism was implemented in JavaScript, Python, Rust, Kotlin, other platforms. They do implement it the same using the colorful functions. So there is, I'm please, I'm not aware of any platform which would be implementing this correctly. But Java is working on the project Loom for last couple years, which is actually trying to implement the thing which I presented in the last demo. They want to build this using a green thread on the user mode level. So these threads do not block the operating system level and we do not have the callers for the functions. So while there is not a platform I'm aware of which would be doing this properly or not breaking it the, the, the way C Sharp does, uh, hopefully Java will explore another way of implementing this and maybe it will influence the computer science world a little more so we will see that it's possible to get a synchronous code without coloring the functions as in C-sharp. Thank you for the reply. Then I have a second question, all of a sudden. Why Microsoft in C-sharp implemented C async in such a flawed way? I mean, why couldn't they do it better? <laughs> that is a very good question again. Uh, fibers in the Windows platform, they are there from the very beginning. Like this is not a construct which is provided for c -sharp language or .NET platform. It's something which is there provided by the Win API. And .NET platform was experimenting with fibers. There is a book by, I don't recall the author, unfortunately, but basically uh, the concurrency, effective concurrency on Windows, uh, I believe the title was. And this book explains that using fibers in C sharp was ultimately dropped and dotnet stopped supporting fibers it officially says we do not support fibers that's because of the issues which we now have in C sharp like fibers were tricky around locking constructs right because you switch fiber you may use your locking mechanism your uh, like mutex primitive in the context you didn't want to use it because you changed the fiber uh, however we have the same issues now back with C sharp so while I cannot tell why uh, why they decided not to use fiber I do know that uh, at some point there was general conception in Microsoft world that fibers are not useful and should be avoided I guess this influenced the decision uh, however currently effectively the the uh, Java world is basically trying to re-implement the fibers in the same way Thank you for the answer. Thank you.